Thank you all for coming to our beleaguered but now joyous city. Um, we really appreciate your coming to not only this conference but coming to support us in this really difficult time for Bostonians. Um, my name is Mary Zanarini. I'm president of NASPD. I'm a professor of psychology at Harvard Medical School and I'm the person uh, beyond our local committee who's had more emails in the last 24 hours than I've had in my life. Um, this is the first annual uh, NASPD conference and we've decided in all probability to hold this conference every year and for the next couple of years to be in Boston. So we hope to see you all again and bring all your friends and colleagues and even more colleagues. Um, what are our goals? We want to encourage the growth of research on personality disorders by expanding the number of younger investigators, by encouraging professionals from all mental health disciplines to become involved, by convincing clinicians that research findings are relevant to their day-to-day -day work, it's not something somebody is doing in a corner with a chi-square and a calculator, it's really something relevant. If Marcia Linehan hadn't done the back-breaking work around DBT or Anthony Baton around mentalization, or Nancy Bloom around steps, there wouldn't be, or Kim Gratz in the back, there wouldn't be any manualized treatments for BPD. We'd all still be doing whatever and praying for the best. Um, and also by welcoming patients and their family members to learn the most up-to-date information pertaining to their condition. Personality disorders, BPD in particular, have been something parents and patients haven't been told about, and they should be told about it because BPD has the best prognosis of all the major psychiatric disorders. Um, let me talk about a few collaborations we've had with Harry Hoffman, the National Education Alliance for Borderline Personality Disorder, NEABPD, which is an advocacy group for those with BPD and their families. And they also developed the Family Connections Family to Family Therapy Program, a very important addition to our range of treatments. We're also collaborating with the BPD Resource Center at New York Presbyterian Hospital, Kernberg's group, Frank Yeoman's group, and we're combining our dinners at the annual meeting of the American Psychiatric Association instead of somewhat strangely holding them on the same evening and being surprised that people didn't know which one to attend. We've decided actually to collaborate. And then uh, we also have our own official journal, uh, it's called Personality Disorders Theory, Research, and Treatment, better known to the insiders as PDTRT. And it's our affiliated journal published, and it's published by the American Psychological Association, and the editor of the journal is sitting in the back. And let's just talk about how far the field has come during the last 20, 25 years. And I'll just talk about a little bit about my own research quickly, because this has really, I think, simply been one of the studies, along with the collaborative longitudinal personality disorder study of FLIPS, that's made us feel that personality disorders are a hopeful diagnosis. In the McLean study of adult development, or MSED, we found that remission, symptomatic remissions are very common. In fact, 99% of people attain one after 16 years of follow-up. Recurrences are relatively rare, and completed suicides are only about half as common as expected. And all of these findings have been confirmed by the FLIPS study at 10 years. Now, while the symptomatic outcome for BPD looks very, very good, there are more guarded prognostic areas. Recoveries involving concurrent remission from BPD and at the same time good social and vocational functioning are more difficult to achieve. And that's primarily because working competently and consistently on a full-time basis is difficult for many of those with BPD. It's not that they're fired from jobs for intriguing behavior. It's more that they're so anxious and so avoidant of their anxiety they never get to the workplace. And also their physical health can also be compromised and that's true for a substantial minority. And it's also true that poor health is mostly in non-recovered patients. They have all kinds of medical syndromes. They suffer from obesity, which is often aggravated or brought on by aggressive polypharmacy, which has no known empirical basis, obesity-related conditions, smoking, and inactivity. Now this simply shows time to remission and recovery, and as you can see, almost everybody has a symptomatic remission, but only 60% have a recovery. A recovery is what we would all want on our CV to say we're doing well. Um, 
and so that's much harder for people to achieve. Now, we have a bunch of evidence, we have a number of evidence-based treatments for BPD. The most well-known is dialectical behavioral therapy, DBT. Marshall Linehan started publishing on this topic uh, 22 years ago. Mentalization-based treatment, MBT of Anthony Bateman and uh, Peter Fonagy, schema-focused therapy, or SFT, which is not practiced that much in the US as far as I know. Transference-focused psychotherapy, TFT of Otto Kernberg, John Farkin, Frank Yeomans, Ken Levy. General Psychiatric Management, GPM, polling Shelley McBain, and John Gunderson is doing a complete revision of this and building upon it and um, going out on the road as an evangelical uh, messenger for this. And Systems Training for Emotional Predictability and Problem Solving Steps, which is an adjunctive treatment developed by Nancy Bloom and Don Black at Iowa. Now going forward, in general, I think it's true for all personality disorders, but BPD has the greatest evidence base. And I'm looking to all the young people who, and all of your students, who are somewhere in a library coming up with a fantastic treatment for BPD. We need shorter, less costly, and more accessible treatments. Many of these treatments are really good, but almost no one can access them because it requires such skilled clinicians, and so many of them, it's simply not a possibility. We also need treatments that focus on what we've called the temperamental symptoms of BPD as well as the acute symptoms of BPD. In other words, undue dependency as well as self-harm, abandonment concerns as well as suicide attempts. Interestingly enough, all of these comprehensive treatments uh, really do aim at the same symptoms and they're the ones that uh, get people in a hospital but they're not the ones that hold people back from uh, having a complete life. So we need a, a second wave of psychotherapy development to really deal with these symptoms. Now other key areas of investigation, we need new pharmaceutical and nutraceutical treatments. Medications can serve a useful, adjunctive, sort of small role in the treatment of BPD. But the idea, of, which is typical in our center and others, of adding four, five, six treatments, one for every symptom, simply costs a lot of money in terms of insurance, leads to obesity, and in general, leads patients to feel that they can take a passive role instead of an active role in getting better. We also need genetic studies, which Larry Seaver, Antonia New are spearheading initiatives in that direction. Many people in the room are doing imaging studies, which are really important. Mm -hmm. And we really need to move beyond being surprised that the amygdala is involved, the limbic system is involved in people being labile or impulsive. We really need to find a way that these tools can become ultimately diagnostic for psychiatric disorders and also as a marker for improvement. And we also need for all of you who are trait psychologists, we need studies of the relationship between personality traits, temperament, which is a slightly different concept and one every mother in the room is familiar with because you bring home a baby who has a temperament. You haven't yet met the personality traits, but the temperament is there, calm baby, fussy baby, and the symptoms that these things underpin. Um, I've been asked to have a few housekeeping comments. Um, Basically, if you could turn off your cell phones, if you could also sign on the sheet for CME credits so you can get them. Um, I also want to thank our sponsors, McLean Hospital, Silver Hill Hospital, Clearview Treatment Programs, the Menninger Clinic, and Austin Riggs Center for helping us to present this conference. And now I'd like to introduce our, um, the co-director of this conference, Perry Hoffman. Thank you, Mary, and uh, welcome to all of you who braved getting up here, and I know it's a celebration in this city, and yet it's also still very sad for what's going on, so we do want to um, note both of those. But it's uh, the National Education Alliance for Borderline Personality Disorders' pleasure to be co-hosting this conference, and when Mary called me to tell me about it, and of course doing a first conference is quite a feat, 
you get better at it as you go along because you understand what the, where the glitches come in. But when Mary told me about it, I said, well, is there any way we can help? Because we have done a lot of conferences, actually probably about 50 now. And when Mary said that she'd like us to join them, that was an incredible honor for us because Mary was one of the first people to speak at one of our first conferences. So for us to come together, and this is how the field grows, but is by collaborations and partnerships, it's a pleasure to be here today, Mary. So thank you, and thank you for being so brave to make sure this conference went on. As I told Mary, I got an email from my husband. I was uh, driving yesterday, and he said, where are you? Because he wasn't sure I was going. And I said, well, we're driving, and we're in the car. And he said, I always thought Mary Zanarini was a genius. So now I emailed him this morning, and I said, I guess she is, because the conference is on. And so here we are today at, um, with wonderful speakers and presenters. I also want to invite you to come to our website, which is easy to remember. It's borderlinepersonalitydisorder.com, and also encourage you to take one of our bracelets that we've left here because next month is BPD Awareness Month as de designated by con Congress. So the more of you that recognize that and help build awareness on this disorder, the more we can advance the agenda and help people impacted by this disorder. So thank you. Now it's my pleasure, and this is really such an honor also for me, to introduce Dr. Charlie Swenson. Um, I could say a lot about Charlie, but um, I guess what, for me what I'll say is he's such a deep personal friend in the sense that he was the one who brought DBT to the East Coast, and I had the good fortune to be on his unit where he was the unit chief. So today to have Charlie here and presenting um, on DBT, in Boston, um, I guess it's about 20, 25 years later, Charlie, right? Since you brought DBT to the East Coast. But this is Mr. DBT. Marsha might be Miss DBT. This is Mr. D or Dr. DBT, I guess is what we say. So I'm going to have Charlie come up and perhaps say a little more about his background because it's quite long and I wouldn't want to miss anything he'd like you all to know about him. So, Charlie? Okay. So to introduce uh, what I'm planning on doing is uh, I want you to uh, understand that my, I'm making the assumption that most of you are familiar with DBT. I don't think you'd be here and not be at all familiar with it, so I'm not going to teach DBT. I think instead what this is is a chance to, uh, to demonstrate it for a half an hour in an interview um, the practice of DBT so that after that I can make a few remarks about how the interview went and what I thought of the essence of DBT in that interview, and then to really have time for you guys to um, raise questions with me about why did I do this, why did I do that, how did I think about this, how did I think about that. That's, I think I, I want to engage you in thinking about DBT in a sort of a hands-on way. Um, so uh, that's, that's my thought about it. Now, uh, I was sent a vignette uh, of about the patient in advance. All, all four of us who are doing this throughout the conference were sent a vignette. So I know a little bit of history that you don't know. And um, in order to think about how to engage you in a DBT learning experience, I realize I, I don't want to just do the initial consultation as if I've never met the patient I'm evaluating because that would not be as distinctive to DBT. It would have distinctive elements. It would have the behavioral, really, emphasis. Um, and, and a lot of factors, a behavioral assessment is different than a psychoanalytic assessment or an assessment for mentalization-based therapy, et cetera. But instead, it's not as distinctive as the first session in therapy after somebody's agreed or is considering being in it. So actually, I'm going to do that. So I want to give you brief history uh, so you know a little about, about what I might know in the, after the intake. Ready yes? Now, now look, um, I lo when I get started with somebody, and that's where we're at. I consider this the beginning. I mean, you've had an intake, but uh, I like to have an idea of what you're aiming for. Like, where, where would you like, I mean, I don't know if you can even think of it, because you've been through, from what I understand, for many years, just kind of like, I don't know, getting your way through mm -hmm. making it life, just staying alive. Uh, but I wonder if you can share with me some thoughts about wha what you'd like to see your life be if, if you could get out of the cycle of behaviors that you're in. You know what, this is why I didn't like the other woman, because if I knew what I wanted to be, I wouldn't be here. I would just go do it. Like, it's not that easy, and it's, 
kind of insulting that you think it's that easy because it's, I've tried to just go and do what's expected of me and I can't do it. You, th you thought that what I said meant that I thought it'd be easy for you to kind of get to I some I mean, it's life. easy for other people, not me. Um, okay. So it's a little insulting already. And uh, which I don't mean to be rude. I'm, I'm sorry if I was rude, but I, this is my last chance and I want it to work. So starting off with a question like that is just like, yeah, I don't know. That's really overwhelming. I don't know what I want to do. I mean, like I wanted to be a gymnast. Now I can't be a gymnast. I was just thinking that I, I, I only saw a little bit about this, about your intake, but it seemed to me that you devoted yourself heart and soul to becoming a gymnast and that didn't work out. It's the only thing I've ever been good at and I can't do it anymore. Uh -huh. It was the first time that in Italy, we, you know, the government actually gave some money to DTD, so it was not a lot of money, but made us very happy that somebody actually acknowledged the presence and the problems on D of DTDs and their families. So we did a small pilot study, uh, 13 family members uh, who were, um, uh, uh, family members, sorry, of seven patient persons with borderline personality disorder. It was a naturalistic study, so we had three post and one year follow up measurements, and I'll tell you more about it. As I said, the treatment was MSG integrated with some DBT skill training. These are some social demographics. So I, I wanted to point out, I would like to know what you think about it, that the mean age is pretty high, and you will see in the Bologna study, it's even higher, it's 34, 35. Uh, just to point out that usually uh, people get to our services uh, after a long time, after has been having been misdiagnosed, uh, usually with access to one disorders and mostly with uh, either MDD or generalized, generalized uh, sorry, anxiety disorder, and they get to the treatment much later on in life. Um, what do we see from us? As for patients, so we use the Zanari rating scale for borderline personality disorder. This is the flow chart of the uh, randomization. So we had 29 referrals, uh, 10 were excluded for not meet the criteria for this inclusion criteria for the study, 19 were enrolled, but four refused. And I will tell you a little bit more about that because sometimes we had problems because patients didn't want families to be in the group without them being there. And uh, um, also, as I said, in my country, there's not a culture about, I don't know, family interventions in this area. So it was a pretty new thing and they didn't want their parents to come. Anyway, we, we 